Wait a minute. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Why don't we get started? Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, research exchange seminar. My name is Professor Sujay King Liu, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Engineering. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, before doing so, however, I'd like to welcome uh, also the viewers uh, who are viewing this on the internet. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I'd like to remind everybody here that we also have a seminar on Friday during the lunch hour, uh, I4 Energy series. And this week, we're going to have a speaker talk about UC Merced's commitment to becoming zero energy and uh, to reach climate neutrality by the, by the year 2020. So I hope you'll come and join us for that interesting talk. All right, today's speaker is Professor Vivek Subramanian of the Electrical and Computer Sciences, uh, sorry, Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences Department here at UC Berkeley. Um, Vivek joined the UC Berkeley faculty in the year 2000 um, after finishing his graduate study at Stanford University. His group studies physics and technology of organic semiconductors and applications for displays, large area flat panel displays, sensors, and um, actuators. Um, and so I'll just list just a couple of his awards. He, when he was much younger, in 2002, he was nominated to the Technology Review Magazine's list of top 100 young innovators. And he was also nominated to the National Academy of Engineering's Frontiers of Engineering um, uh, as a prestigious uh, symposium and he uh, earned a National Science Foundation Young Investigator Award. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the podium uh, Professor Vivek Subramanian. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what I'm going to do, actually, surprisingly, this is the first time I'm actually attending the research exchange. I didn't realize there was so much food. I should probably come more often. Uh, what, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to uh, tell you about the research that my group does on printed electronics. Uh, and specifically, what I'm going to do is try to tell you about how printed electronics is really the merging of two very different fields. It's semiconductors, which is a vibrant field, moving very rapidly, lots of changes, most people have advanced degrees, and printing, which is several, actually several centuries old, and frankly, as I've discovered over the last 12 years of working on this, while there have been innovations in printing, there's almost been no progress in developing new physics to un understand and explain printing specifically. There has been a lot of progress in, print in fluid mechanics, but very little in applying that fluid mechanics to printing problems. And it turns out, as I'm going to show you when we talk about printed electronics, there really are some tremendous challenges in combining those two fields. Of course, everything I'm going to tell you about is work that I personally have not done. It's all been done by my students. One of the luxuries of being at Berkeley is we have a terrific group of uh, graduate students here, and my students are sitting there. So the one advantage of giving a talk is I can always guarantee that I'll have at least some of my students here, because I've got a fairly large group. OK, so what we'll do is I will tell you about uh, printed electronics. I'll start by talking about what we want to do in printed electronics. Specifically, I'll address why you would want to print. So let's start with that. So, fundamentally, when people talk about printed electronics, the first statement you will hear from people is it's cheap. And here's an example of a printer in a research center I run in Korea. Uh, this is a gravure printer. It has four stations, and it prints at about six feet per second. And it's print, we actually already, we routinely print RFID tags, functional tags with this printer at six feet per second. So it's an incredibly fast machine. Uh, but when, you, when printed electronics first came out, and this is about a decade ago, one of the things you probably read when you read the lay press was, one day we'll be printing Pentiums. And I will tell you that's false. We will never be printing microprocessors this way. And if you wanted to do so, it would be a really dumb idea. So, and I'll tell you why. So let's talk about cost in particular. This is the first point to make about printed electronics. Printed electronics is cheap per unit area, but it is not cheap per transistor. And here's why. Printing is very fast. We can spit out large, um, large amounts of plastic or paper or cloth very rapidly, but our line widths are much worse. So let's take some numbers. A silicon transistor on a modern integrated circuit costs roughly one nanocent, 10 to the minus 9 US cents. Okay? A printed transistor using the techniques we use, even printing at these really high speeds, are on the order of about a micro, uh, actually about a millicent, or a little less than a millicent. So 
we're about six orders of magnitude more expensive than a silicon transistor. So if you wanted to make a system where you wanted millions of transistors, it makes absolutely no sense to do it by printing. But printing is about two orders of magnitude cheaper per unit area than even glass displays used, using conventional techniques, and about four orders of magnitude cheaper than silicon. So if you're looking at an application where you want to do things over a fixed area, printing makes a lot of sense. And so the obvious applications of printed R electronics are in things like displays, and it turns out in low frequency communication circuits because the passive components in a communication circuit says, set the size of the circuit, and also in some sensing applications. But the fundamental problem is if you just talk about cost, new technologies are never cheap because you have to pay for the cost of R&D. And this is arguably why printed electronics to this point has not had any really big industrial successes because everything people have gone after so far are driven by cost. And that's not a good way to get new technologies into the market. So what else can we do? It turns out the other thing that printing does really well is it allows us to integrate multiple mutually compatible materials on the same substrate. You do this every day. When you're printing color, you print three or four inks on the same substrate. The added cost of addition, adding additional colors is not that high, and you can put them on the same substrate very easily. You don't even worry about it. The same is true for printed electronics. We can add multiple materials that might be mutually incompatible with each other on the same substrate, and the added cost of doing so is not so high. So instead of living, limiting ourselves to one functional unit, a transistor, we can put a whole bunch of materials that may be incompatible with each other on the same substrate. So for example, we can put multiple things. We can build sensors and batteries and passive components and active components and display elements all on the same substrate. And if we're doing things like digital printing, so inkjet is an example, we can customize on the fly. So it turns out I've, I've worked for many years with a startup company called Covio. They're uh, the next generation Los Angeles Transit Agency limited use subway tag. It was a tag that I was involved in designing, and it turns out it uses digital printing to do customization for making sure that every tag is unique. And that is something that printing does allow us to do. And then, finally, it allows us to use flexible substrates, plastic. We routinely print on plastic in my group, paper, or potentially even cloth. So you can do things that are lightweight, robust, and flexible. OK, so that's the broad picture of why printing is, is interesting. But there's been a wonderful thing that's happened to printed electronics over the last three to four years. And it has nothing to do with printed electronics. It has to do with this, the smartphone. The traditional problem with a lot of the applications we were looking for for printed electronics was really dumb devices are not that easy to work with. Because to give you some perspective, our transistors about two, are two orders of magnitude slower than even 10-year-old silicon transistors. In some cases, more than that. And so that means that there's not much we can do. And so traditional ideas of using dumb devices still required you to get information in and out of those devices. But we now have something new. We have the cloud, so that does data aggregation, et cetera. But we have now got a gateway to the cloud. We now have a cell phone that implements a protocol called NFC. Turns out we can already make printed transistors into circuits that are NFC compliant. And what that allows you to do is you can now put a whole road of different devices around. And I should give credit to Jan Rabai. He called this the swarm, and it's a very compelling vision. And you can put a whole host of different devices around that use the cell phone as a gateway to do really interesting things. And the things you can do are you can put printed sensors and very simple displays and simple computational devices in this cloud. And now you get the benefit of aggregate. You get the benefit of having millions of these devices and doing really interesting things like environmental monitoring or product quality detection and so on. And there's, to make this happen, we need to have a lot of them, which means they have to be cheap. So this is potentially an area where printed electronics is going to see a new opportunity to emerge. And it looks like it's happening. We're starting to see a lot of sensing type applications starting to emerge. But the, the classic example that I've always used is the example of smart packaging. So let's take a, a can of soup and say, well, what can we do to make it better? And now I'm not going to talk about making it taste better, but I'll, let's talk about the packaging of it. One thing that's been a traditional idea for printed electronics is doing RFID, so electronic barcodes. 
That is one thing, in fact, we can already do today. They don't, they're not standards compliant yet, but they work moderately well. We can print RFID tags today on little strips of plastic, and we can attach them to these objects, and then we can read them over short distances, but it eliminates the need for optical scanning. The other application where printed electronics has already had a fair amount of success is in real-time labeling. We can make very simple displays uh, that are very cheap. They don't have a huge information content, but they're good enough to do things like tell you pricing or, uh, for example, do automatic inventory. I'll give you a classic example. It turns out in supermarkets, uh, the supermarkets really want you to buy the meat that is just about to expire or the dairy that's just about to expire. One way they do, they used to do that, is they would reduce the price right before expiry. But it turns out in the US, it's more expensive for them to go and retag the price than to just throw it away, which is crazy to think about. If we can do real time, so we have a communication device that talks to the supermarket, and we have a real time pricing system that updates at an item level, we can address that problem. And then the final thing we could do is we could put sensors. As you probably know, well, we all do this. You know, you, you buy a, can, a bottle of milk and it sits in your fridge for a while and it's past the expiry date, but you don't throw it away. You, you sniff it, yeah, it smells okay, and you drink it. Um, that's for a good reason. It turns out 99.39% of objects have not expired by the time you hit the expiry date. And that has to be true because if any fraction exp expired, you'd be suing the company. So it's inherently a very conservative measure. What if we could close that loop and we could add in product quality monitoring? So that's the other area that printed electronics is now starting to work at. And you'll see that a lot of the new applications that are emerging are combining these things. Little bit of, of communication and com computation, maybe some display and some sensing. And these need to be done at low cost, but they need to in integrate diverse functionalities. So it's falling squarely in the place where printed electronics really appears to make a lot of sense. OK, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to lay out some of the system needs that we would have to address. And I'm going to address them by talking about printing technology. So I will talk about fluid mechanics. I promise you I won't have any equations, but I'll show you plots that show you how things work. And I'll talk about inks. So I'm going to talk about fluids and inks, and I'll show you how we use those to make devices. So what we have on this end is the world. It's the smartphone and the cloud and so on. And what we have on this end is the device that's going to communicate with the world. Well, we need power. That turns out to be pretty easy. We're already able to make devices that get sufficient power for operation by inductive coupling. So I'll show you about that. But we can go a step further. We can make batteries. So we can put batteries that we can print and they can be integrated into our devices. And it turns out they're air stable and they have good energy density and they have enough power to operate our systems. So we can make these sorts of devices. We can make simple digital logic circuits. And these are things that are running, uh, as you'll see later, we can get up into the hundreds of kilohertz range, which is plenty for the kinds of applications we're interested in. And then finally, what we can do is we can put in sensors. I used this example many years ago when I was, I'd probably been at Berkeley for a couple of years, so it was about a decade ago. They, uh, the New York Times did an article on printed sensors and electronic noses, and they featured our work. And it was just sort of funny to me because I'm a fairly militant vegetarian, and what they picked to show was a slab of meat. But, uh, and, and I will tell you, I don't think meat is a good application. Um, because it turns out detecting spoilage in meat is really tricky. There's about a, a million different ways meat can spoil. If you knew all the ways meat can spoil, you probably wouldn't eat it. Okay? But uh, ph pharmaceuticals are really good because pharmaceuticals are high value items and it's very important to monitor their spoilage and the ways they spoil are much more limited because they're often in sealed environments. So the big new area that printed electronics is going into right now, and there's a lot of companies in this space, is sensors for pharmaceuticals. So then the next thing to talk about is given these, these ideas, let's talk about what we want to do. And so I'm going to start by talking about printing. For those of you who come from the silicon world, you'll recognize this as a layout of some arbitrary circuit. I don't remember what this was. I think it was part of an op amp from many years ago. And this is an arbitrary silicon circuit. And you take this for granted. You take for granted that what you can do is you can have multiple layers, and you'll define them as a series of squares and rectangles. And you'll make a mask that projects it, and you'll get something that's pretty close to it. 
And we have multiple layers of software in the silicon world that makes this happen. We have software we use for simulation, we have software we use for layout, and we have software for post-processing. I'll give you a specific example. If you are trying to make a state-of-the-art layout, and you want to make a rectangle, what's on your mask is actually not a rectangle. It's sort of like a rectangle, but it has carrots on the end. And the reason is when the light goes through the mask, they're scattering. And when the right light hits the wafer, they're scattering. And what they do is they make sure that they've done the optical calculations to ensure that what you finally get is moderately close to a rectangle. We need to do the same thing for printed electronics. We need to build the same chain of software and hardware and system knowledge to allow us to do this. But the physics changes. Instead of dealing with the physics of light scattering, we're dealing with the physics of fluids. And so essentially, that's what we have to do. We need to deliver this to make it happen. And within my group and many other groups around the world, we've put a lot of these pieces in place. Uh, what I tell people is when I first started in printed electronics, and this is 12 years ago, every single material my group used, we synthesized ourselves. We built our own printers. We synthesized our own materials. We built our own devices. We built our own circuits. Today, about more than half the materials we use, we buy commercially. There's now commercial printers, not quite as good as ours, but pretty close. Everything's falling in place. So the opportunities for printed electronics have gotten much bigger with progress. Within my group, we work on two main printing techniques. We work on inkjet printing, and we work on gravure printing. So inkjet printing you're all familiar with, because most of us have had inkjet printers at some point in time. The big advantages of inkjet printing is it's a very flexible technique. It's digital input, so you can change designs on the fly gets down to about a 10 micron resolution, but it has several problems. Uh, in particular, it's inherently pixelated. You're building patterns with individual drops, and it turns out when you shoot a million drops out of an inkjet head, they don't all fall at the same point. There's a certain uncertainty of, of the ejection, and that itself is on the order of about 10 microns. And it gets worse as your features get smaller. You actually get Brownian motion of the drops that drives them even wider. So it's not scaling very well, and it turns out to be somewhat slow. But it is the workhorse technique in printed electronics because it's very well studied. It is by far the most studied technique for printed electronics. Within my group and about three or four other groups in the world, we also do work on gravure printing. Now, gravure printing you're all familiar with. It's a technique that's used to print currency and postage stamps. So it's a metallic cylinder with wells etched into it. You ink the cylinder, and you use it to print. It's used for currency, postage stamps, and glossy magazines because the pattern fidelity is very good. So the one thing I guarantee my students is no matter what, they will always have money because they can always be forgers. So that's at least that part is covered. Okay? And uh, the, the big advantage of gravure, well, it has an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is we can get below 10 microns. No problem. Um, some of my students are now in the single micron range in terms of what we're able to do. The other big advantage is it prints really fast. We print at one meter per second, approximately. The other joke I make, some of you have heard me say this before, is when I run my printers at full speed, I exhaust my entire annual research budget in two hours of printing. So on that note, if any of you would like to support my research, you know. <laughs> so, so, but no, this, it, it is, it's, a power, the big, it's, it's expensive in research because it's so fast, but imagine the benefits in production. It's really fast. Uh, but one of the other things I should point out, you'll notice these are custom machines. These are not your desktop printers that you're used to. These are semiconductor manufacturing tools with vibration control, particle minimization strategies, cameras to do inline inspection, software to control. You need that to make this work. So what we then do is once we've got this to work, once we've got these printers that are really stable, let's talk about actual printing. And I'm going to use inkjet as an example, frankly, because we've been working on inkjet for over a decade and we have a pretty good understanding of it. So let's take an example of trying to print a line. And the big difference between printed electronics and graphic, as in graphic arts, is the substrate. In graphic arts, we have a very forgiving substrate. We print on paper. And paper, we have two beautiful things that help us. One is the eye averages out defects. So you don't see a lot of defects that exist. And two is the paper absorbs solvent. So it sort of takes care of everything. All the solvent goes into the paper, and you don't have to worry about where that solvent goes. When you print on plastic and you're printing electronic systems, one dot missing could be an open circuit. One dot in the wrong place could be a short circuit. And you have to worry about where the solvent is going because it's really not getting absorbed in the plastic. And so it turns out understanding this is critical. 
And so here's an example of a series of prints done on, a, on, on plastic with the very same ink. And all I've, I've kept the temperature the same. I've kept the ink the same. Everything's the same except I've changed the drop spacing, the, the separation between my drops. Basically, how much my printer moves before I print. And you see that there can be hugely different patterns I can get. I can get isolated drops. I can get scalloped lines. I can get this nice smooth line, which is what I want, because this is what I'm using to build my transistors. Or if I'm not careful, I'll get something like this, where it looks like I'm getting a really smooth line, and then suddenly I get a bulge. And then it goes away, and then I get another bulge. And you think initially, oh, something must have gone wrong with my printer, my stages weren't correct, but it's systemic to the way inks flow. And so let me give you at a high level a few snapshots of the things that we care about. In other words, how graphic arts problems, how printing problems have to be addressed to make printed electronics real. So let's consider an arbitrary drop uh, of a solvent containing ink falling down and hitting a substrate that does not absorb the ink. So uh, the, the, the ink will, call, will spread. It'll form some, some, some sort of hemispherical cap. And it turns out, for many of these systems, the drop ultimately gets pinned. In other words, it expands to a certain radius and gets pinned to that point. Now consider what happens. The solvent is evaporating out of the drop. It cannot be absorbed into the substrate. So the solvent is only coming out from the top. And if you were to sort of do a projection of surface area to volume for any part of this system, there's a huge amount of surface area to volume at the edge and a very small amount of surface area to volume at the center. And so what that means is there's much more evaporation flux at the edge than at the center. And what happens is that causes a convective flux that pulls the ink to the edges of the drop. And this has been known for quite a while. It's well understood and explained. And it is called the coffee ring effect. And it's called the coffee ring effect because at the end, what you get is you get the same pattern you get if you leave a dirty coffee ring on a, on a, on a table. You get that ring of material on the edges. And so you see, I'm trying to print a, a line, but what I got is I got all my material to move to the edges. And this is really bad because it's exactly where I, what I don't want. It's not smooth. The ink is not where I want it to be, and my feature definition is poor. So there's ways to address it, and we have techniques to essentially control the convective flows to essentially eliminate that. But it extends to other problems. And so let me show you line formation. Specifically, I'm going to explain that bulge using the same idea. So let's say we've started printing a line, and I put the next drop down. When I put this next drop down, depending on how far this drop is from this line, there's going to be some connection point. Coffee ring, the same behavior that causes the coffee ring, is going to cause the ink from this drop to want to flow back into the line. Because it, that's what the convective flow will drive. If this connection point is too narrow, the ink is not able to flow back into the line before it evaporates sufficiently here for the pattern to gel. And so you end up getting scallops. This is what I don't want. On the other hand, if the connection point is really large, there's massive flow of ink back into the line. But what is this line? It's a pipe. You know that there's a maximum flow that a pipe can accommodate at a given pressure differential. So the pipe takes what it can, but ultimately it's just not able to take it when it's got a huge flow back into it. So it just bulges out. And it bulges out, and the moment it bulges out, it's become a wider pipe. And so it accepts the flow, and it necks back down again, and then it grows a little bit longer, and then again it gets constrained, and then it bulges out again. And so there's a perfectly predictable separation between the bulges. And we can model this perfectly. Today we can use very simple, closed form analytical models that describe all of these regimes. What we are getting to is we're getting to the software. But our software is now physics of fluid flow. It's not optical proximity effects. And so we essentially can model this and control our regimes. Uh, I'll give you another interesting example. This is one more that's, uh, uh, that I think really illustrates some of the issues we have to deal with. If you try to print a square, we want squares. Uh, most, of, most electronic circuits that we build are based on what we call Manhattan geometries, which means squares and rectangles. So if I'm trying to print a square, and I just do it by placing uniform drops, it turns out it's really difficult to get a square square. What you'll invariably get is all sorts of non-idealities. The place you start printing will bulge out. And the place you finish printing will break up into separate beads. And the reasons for this, it turns out, are also fairly straightforward. 
Let's say I'm building this square. I start printing at one end, and I work down, and I keep working over with my inkjet system. As I'm adding each additional drop, I'm adding an increase in volume, the volume of the new drop, and I'm adding an increase in surface area because I've placed that drop a further distance away. When I go from one drop to two drops, I've doubled the volume and I've roughly doubled the area. But when I go from 31 drops to 32 drops, those ratios aren't the same anymore. So what's happening is the amount, the change in volume versus the change in area is constantly changing. And there are certain conditions under which you exceed the, the, the so-called advancing contact angle. And what will happen is the ink will flow out very rapidly and cause a bulge. And that's why early in the printing, when you've just started, when there's large changes in volumes and area, you get bulging. And late in printing, when there's small changes in uh, volume and area, you get bead separation. So how do we solve it? Well, pretty easy. We write software that says, Let's figure out in real time, as we are building our pattern, what our equilibrium conditions are. And instead of trying to print a square that is a square, we print a square that's not a square, but we know based on the fluid mechanical considerations, when it's finished flowing, it'll be a square. So I call that print proximity correction, because essentially it's like optical proximity correction, which is used in the semiconductor industry, but is dealing with the fluid mechanics of fluid flow. And by doing this, we're able to make nice squares. All right, so that's all focused on inkjet. Gravure has many of the same problems, and in fact, even more. But the beauty of gravure is the control we can achieve. So it, commercial gravure for printing poster boards runs and, and currency runs at 400 meters per minute. So that's blazingly fast. The way it works is you have a metal cylinder with wells etched into it. You ink the wells, you wipe it, and then you transfer and you create a pattern. The big advantage of this technique is the pattern fidelity we're able to achieve. So we are able to print lines across a two-foot sheet that have a line edge roughness on the order of one micron. So we're able to get very high quality lines with nice shapes, and these are getting to the point where we can use them to make circuits, and I'll show you some results. So let's say at this point we figured out how to print. Uh, hopefully, I've convinced you at this point that we seem to understand a lot of the physics. I wouldn't say we understand it all. And if there's any of you who are interested in working on interesting research problems in fluid mechanics, there's a whole lot of them we want to work on. And we're working on some, but there's a whole bunch that still need to be worked on. A lot of interesting problems. And then, we've now learned how to print. We need the inks. So what are the inks we're going to use? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the inks that we use. Within my group, our core expertise really, is making nanoparticles for printed electronics. Even though I started out in organic electronics, frankly, the vast majority of my work is on nanoparticle systems. And really, we exploit one property of nanoparticles only. And that is, when you take a nanoparticle, when you take a, some material, and you make it really, really small, you get a dramatic reduction in melting point. So the classic example that's very well known is gold. Bulk gold has a melting point of about 1,000 degrees Celsius. Nanoparticle gold, we can make it small enough that it melts at about 100 degrees Celsius. So you see what I've been able to do. I can now make these tiny little particles of various materials. I can print them onto plastic, and I don't have to melt the plastic. I just get hot enough that the nanoparticles melt, and I can get really high quality films. I can get films that approach bulk qualities, both in terms of mechanical properties and in terms of electronic properties. And so what we do is we make these nanoparticles, we encapsulate them with organic ligands to stabilize them, we print them onto a plastic substrate, we heat them up, and then the nanoparticles fuse together to form high quality conductors. There's a lot of optimization that has to happen. We have to optimize the temperature at which they sinter. But you can see we're easily able to hit sintering temperatures that are fully plastic compatible, down in the 100C range. We have to optimize how much they compact. If they compact too much while they sinter, you get cracks. If they stay porous, if they don't compact enough, they're porous, and you don't get good conductivity. But by optimizing all of this, it turns out we are able to make conductors that can get really close to bulk metal properties. We can hit, for thin films, as high as 70% of bulk conductivity, we've reported. So these, that's remarkable when you think about it. We're using fluids, we're printing them with inkjet heads by spitting them out, and we can get conductivity that's as good as sputtered films. That's just a remarkable result. There's a lot of physics that's behind this. It's not as simple as saying, you print a particle, and magically what comes out is a film. 
We have to optimize everything. So there's a lot of material science that goes into this. And there's no, unfortunately, for better or worse, most groups in the world working on nanoparticles want to study the particles themselves. Whereas we are so-called nanosadists. We make nanoparticles to destroy them. That's all we do, okay? And we destroy them in a way that we understand. We understand how they go from individual particles to being films. And so there's a lot of physics here, and it's a lot of work on our, on our side and a lot of work with collaborators, where we work to understand how nanoparticles center. And by understanding all of these processes, we can get films with good conductivities at low, operating, at low sintering temperatures that are plastic compatible. And so there's a lot of detailed physics to understand it, but here's the key point. We can make films that get conductivities that are close to bulk. And we can do it for, for metals, and I'll show you in a little while, we've also got really good semiconductors and dielectrics as well. And so we can then use these, now that we have good printing capability, you see nice lines, and we've got good materials, you see high quality conductors, we can make a whole range of different things. We can make passive components, so antenna structures, and we can even make transistors. So this is how we print our transistors. Print a gate, could be nanoparticles. Print a dielectric, maybe a polymer, maybe a nanoparticle. Print a source and drain. Print a semiconductor. And we can do all of this at temperatures that are compatible with plastic. In fact, we have one project where we are actually printing on paper. And many years ago, we demonstrated that we could build transistors on fibers as well for cloth. So you can really apply these on virtually anything. And we can make reasonable transistors. Now, what does reasonable mean? Reasonable means they're about as good as the transistor behind each pixel in this display. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an amorphous silicon transistor behind every pixel in this display. And we can get transistors that are pretty similar to that in terms of their, their performance. That's about as good as we can get. But that's good enough for a lot of applications. But it turns out there's a lot of problems. And let me show you one of them. My printing is not that accurate. I can make fine lines, moderately fine lines, but I can't place them really precisely. And think about an electronic device. It's inherently a multi-layer device with multiple layers of material stacked on top of each other. That means these layers, the source and drain, need to align to the gate. Well, I don't have any way to do that very well with printing. So what I end up with then is I end up with massive overlap, and that's a big problem. Again, fluid mechanics comes to the rescue. So here's what we do. We print a gate, we print a gate dielectric, we print a source and drain, but we've engineered the properties of the gate dielectric and the source and drain so that the ink rolls off and it pins right at the gate edge at the corner. And we can do this repeatably and reliably, and when we get our final transistors, we have overlaps that are well below a micron. And look at the error bars on this. So again, there's a lot of really interesting fluid problems to be solved here. I, you know, when I got into this field, I, I came as a straight semiconductor person. But today, there's about a third of my group doing fluid mechanics, a third of my group doing materials development, synthetic chemistry, and only a third are doing sort of straight up hardcore device work. So it's a really interesting set of problems to solve. And then we can use this to make reasonable devices, and we can extend it to really sophisticated techniques. So here's an example where we're printing full circuits this way. Let's say I have three transistors that I'm trying to connect in a cascode. So I want to connect them end to end. And the normal way to do it would be you do little interconnects to connect them. But here's what we do. We print a stripe all the way across. And watch, watch, it separates and self-aligns. And so you can then extend these to really sophisticated things. We can do circuits this way. And we're able to, using this technique with very poor materials, materials with mobilities well below one centimeter square per volt second, we can make circuits that are running in the close to 100 kilohertz range, which is good enough for displays. And we can take that a step further. I've told you gravure has very high pattern fidelity. So we can use gravure printing to print really fine transistors. So again, print a gate, print a gate dielectric, print a source drain, print a semiconductor. And this printer is running at one meter per second. So it's flying. And we can then use these and make transistors. But again, fluid mechanics is important. It turns out if you're trying to print two lines close to each other, there's a, because of the way the solvents interact, there's a bulge that develops at the end of the line. And now this is, if you're a if transistor guy, you know this is a really bad idea. What I've got is I've got a point here where I've got really high fields. I'm probably going to break this device down. I might get a short circuit. This is really bad. 
But fluid mechanics tells us how to address that problem. I instead of printing it straight lines, you print hockey sticks. And the hockey sticks essentially guide the ink away, and we're able to get really fine gaps. In the silicon industry, all of the software to do this, design rules, software to do proximity correction, it all exists. We need to do the same thing for printed electronics. And it is happening. So we can then use this to make reasonable transistors. And we are now able to make transistors with transition frequencies above, and these are on plastic sheets, above a megahertz. And these are printed at one meter per second. So you can see the kinds of speeds we're able to attain. We're not limited just to polymer materials. We can also do some other interesting materials. I've mentioned that, we, that uh, nanoparticles are really interesting to us. Well, one nanoparticle that is real, one nanoparticle system that's very interesting is actually the, the family of transparent conductive oxides, in particular zinc oxide and its analogs. So zinc oxide is sort of an interesting material. Uh, it has several nice properties. It's got a large band gap, a large enough band gap that it's transparent. So we can actually print transistors that are as transparent as glass. And so we can build transistors on glass that you don't see. And we can build these out of nanoparticles, or we can build them out of other techniques to make them. And the beauty is for a display, if you were to look at the pixel behind your, the transistor behind each pixel right now, it blocks light. So we're losing energy, and we're limiting our scalability. But with transparent materials, we can essentially eliminate that trade-off. We can put arbitrary transistors behind the pixels and get them to work. And so we make zinc oxide nanoparticles and we can print them and we can get actually really good results. On plastic, we have mobilities now that are getting close to one centimeter square per volt second. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes at glass compatible temperatures, we're now at mobilities above 100. So these are very recent results and we are now able to make transistors on glass using tin oxide and zirconia, all solution processed. So these are all done with inks, with mobilities above 100, which means we can start doing really serious things now. I mean, we have enough performance to start addressing serious computational issues with these sorts of devices. So but we're also, I'm a transistor guy. I like working on transistors. But we're not just limited to transistors. And I'll show you one example of some of the other things we can do. So we can, in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Professor King Liu, what we do is we actually build MEMS devices. So using printing techniques, we can actually print things like cantilevers. And one of the big problems in displays, it turns out, is what really matters for a display, especially an LCD, is not the on current, it's the off current. Because the, the blackness of your black, as opposed to the grayness of your black, depends on how low your leakage current is. A little bit of leakage means your black looks gray, and the eye picks that up right away. So off-current is really important. Well, there's one way to make a really good off-current device. We make a mechanical switch. So we print a mechanical switch, and you can see that's inkjet printing. We're actually building MEMS devices with inkjet. And these switches have beautiful characteristics. They are essentially 100% off when they're off. We're at the noise floor. And it turns out they switch at the, up to a megahertz, hundreds of kilohertz to a megahertz range. So you wouldn't want to use them for high performance things, but a display runs at 120 kilohertz top speed, uh, 20, 120 hertz top speed for the, for, the, for the row addressing. So this is, works great. And these are some of the things that printed electronics enables. So I'll end by pulling together one more application. And the other application I'm going to pull together is the electronic nose, because this is something that we've been working on for many years, and it's now something that companies are starting to commercialize. So if you ask anybody who's worked on organic transistors, especially in the early days, what was the biggest problem with organic materials? They would say they're unstable. You'd expose them to air, they would degrade. You'd expose them to moisture, they would degrade. Uh, the joke is you, you look at them and they degrade. Okay, That's literally how unstable they were. But it turns out that degradation could be useful, but only in specific ways. In the early days, people would say, well, it, it degrades, you can use it as a sensor. But a sensor is only useful if it has specificity. You've got to avoid false positives. But we can get that. Here's what we do. We print different organic transistors with their channels exposed, but with different organic materials. Each organic semiconductor is functionalized to be a little bit different. One may have an amine on it, one may have a carboxylic acid on it, and then when you expose it to something in the air, it responds slightly differently. And then you map out the signature, 
and you get chemical identification. This is, by the way, exactly how biological noses work. If you look at biological noses, our individual scent cells are nonspecific. One of your scent cells cannot tell the difference between the smell of a rose and a rotten egg. You get it by having pattern matching with a computer. Now, we cannot reach that level of sophistication, but we can do things like avoid false positives. And that is the key. And so I'll show you one example. Uh, unfortunately, all the students who are here didn't get, and from my group, didn't get to benefit from this. This was a really fun project. So we worked with Jean Frechet in chemistry, and we made a bunch of polythiophenes, and we mapped out their signatures, and then we put them into a specific sensor. But the sensor was a lot of fun. So I, we worked with a European group. Um, it's a wine company, but I'm not allowed to tell you who the wine company is, because wine companies don't want to acknowledge that there's science in wine. And, uh, we, did, we made wine sensors that detected spoilage of red wine. And it was great because my students got free wine for like two years. So, so it, was, it was a great project. Uh, the, the sensors get down to the single ppm level. They're not very fast. They respond over the course of seconds. But for these sorts of applications, it's OK. And what we could do is we, we basically would make a sensor that detected the ratios of alcohol and acetic acid. And as red wine spoils, it gets sour. And it turns out that's because there's a few ppm rise in acetic acid, and you can detect that. And when, as I said, the final piece you need is power. And these are printed batteries. And these are on plastic sheets. And they work really well. And they're air stable. And they're done using the same materials, techniques, and material sets that we would then put together to make full systems. So you can really dream about systems now where you're putting all of these pieces together. So let me end. What do I think the future is for printed electronics? I think there's tremendous opportunities for these integrated systems. Displays is a good application, but that's fundamentally a cost play. I think the real opportunities for printed electronics are on these integrated systems. Because we can do things that cannot be done in a reasonable way right now. We can make these tiny sensors that have sensing, batteries, authentication circuits, all on a sheet of plastic. I work on two print techniques, and I work on those for a reason. I don't think there's a single print technique that addresses every problem. We can mix and match, and that is completely OK. We can build printers that have multiple types of print techniques put together. And they have tremendous flexibility, and we should exploit that at a system level. But I do think there's a lot of science and engineering that remains to be done, and that is the key. And what we have to do is we have to merge the 500-year-old field of conventional graphic arts printing with the advances we have that have made semiconductor industry possible and put them together to do the same thing for printed electronics. So I'll stop right there. Uh, I should acknowledge some very, of course, my students are sitting over there. They've done all the work. Uh, I have some very good collaborators, uh, Professor Morris in mechanical engineering, uh, Professor Mattis in uh, uh, chemistry, and then Jean Frechet, who I've worked very close with for, closely with for many years in chemistry, and then collaborators now in electrical engineering. Ana Arias has just joined the group. So we've got a really nice cluster of people working on printed electronics, and Professor King Liu. It's, it's been a lot of fun. We are doing a lot, solving a lot of interesting problems, and they're fundamentally interdisciplinary problems which make for good and well-trained graduate students, which is ultimately the key. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. So do we have any questions from the audience? I know it was very clear to me, so if you're anyone. Here we go. It looks as if uh, liquid inks have a lot of complexity in them. So that raises for me the question, is there, are there any potential advantages to printing with solid inks? Um, the, so the question was, oh, is there an advantage to printing with solid inks given the complexity of liquid inks? Absolutely. There's no doubt. There are solid printing techniques that are much simpler. You don't have to worry about coffee ring. Uh, and many of the solid printing techniques actually have surprisingly high throughput in modern techniques. The difficulty with solid printing techniques as they exist today is they typically waste a lot of material on the source side. And these materials in many cases are not that cheap. And what makes the systems cheap is we're not using very much of them. So the classic example is the wax transfer techniques. You'd waste the whole sheet of wax to print one pattern. And if we could address that problem, absolutely. I think there are some developments occurring for solid printing that make a lot of sense. Uh, but I don't think it addresses every problem. Question over here. So 
So along the same lines as dry printing techniques, what about something like spray drying, um, some sort of drying during the delivery process? Uh, I mean, well, so drying during the delivery process actually already exists. There's a company that makes an aerosol printer already that essentially dries as it hits the substrate. Uh, yes, so I, I do think it has a place, absolutely. Most of those aerosol-like processes are not fast enough to do everything. I mean, they're just orders of magnitude off in terms of throughput. So I think they'll be really good for very specific things, but for you know, throwing out sheets of printed conductors, you probably want to do them with something like Gravure. But there are companies doing aerosol printing, and it actually their results are really good. So. There you go. Uh, I'm very inspired by the like, future of the cloud thing. Um, but one question I have in mind is that we are, uh, sometimes when we are recycling stuff, there's something called electronic waste. Mm -hmm. So if we are putting all those electronics on all the packages of the food, and uh, is there any recycling issue? Um, the, so that, absolutely. Uh, I, there are certain big issues that have not been addressed yet. One is recycling. The other is actually toxicity. Uh, for example, we use silver in a lot of our work. In Europe, you're not allowed to uh, dispose of silver in waste. So for, for good reason, it, 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 there's a biological hazard with silver. And there's some, several other materials like that. So the answer is absolutely, I don't know how to address them. So it is an important problem. I think it is going to require the entire supply chain to align, including people on the other end who are looking at reprocessing and recycling. It, 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 undoubtedly, it's an issue. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, thank you again, Professor Sivermanian, for a great talk.